Hey guys, welcome to the Neglected Podcast. This podcast is not to change your mind, but to invite you into somebody else's narrative. This is a podcast to give a voice to the neglected. It is also an opportunity for all of us to engage. Hey, what's going on, everybody? Welcome to the Neglected Podcast. My name is Nick Schultz. You can hit me up at Schultzy Time. We are at For the Neglected. We're here with the producer, my man Quinn. What's going on? Thanks for being here. We're at City Church, and we have a very special guest today. She was in my wedding, and she drove all the way up here from Orlando, four hours away. I wish to say it was just for the podcast, but it was also because you're spending Thanksgiving with us as well. It is Lindsay Dennis, and you are my sister-in-law, so welcome. Thank you for having me, brother-in-law. Yes, and um, I don't know if it was a choice necessarily, but I did ask if you wanted to do it, but- I didn't feel like I could say no. You could not say no, that's true, you could not say no. You had to do it, and it's the first family member, so this could either pave the way for something amazing, or this could be the end of the podcast. It's true, and, yes. <laughs> and cause a lot of problems on Turkey bus. Day, yeah. No, but you have a very powerful story that we've got to experience firsthand for some of the stuff you've been through. And I've known you since you were probably in college, I'm guessing. I think so, yeah. You started dating your sister when she was a very junior young. high school. Or yeah. Way too young. Now, so, <laughs> yeah, we're gonna keep some of that out maybe. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, I've known you for a long time and um, you're awesome. So I want to give you the opportunity. You've had chances to tell your story and you've mm-hmm. actually written a book about some of your experiences, but had to have you on here because it's perfect for what we're trying to do and, and, and kind of people we're trying to reach and, and speak for those people who can't speak for themselves mm-hmm. sometimes. So thank you. You're welcome. But let us start with how you grew up, your background, family, where you're from, all that kind of stuff. So go for it. So I grew up in Ohio, Pennsylvania and Ohio. And I grew up in a family of Christ followers and my parents were missionaries for 30 some years. And so I grew up really faith being a huge part of my life and huge part of my journey. Um, I have two brothers and one sister. That's right. (laughs) Don't forget any of them. (laughs) Don't blank. Mine blank. Um, And I'm the oldest of all four of them. So I was the bossy one. I was the one who paved the way and- We do have that in common. Yes, (laughs) all the restrictions. And then my youngest brother got to do anything he wanted. I know, and still, no. Um, But I love my family. They were a great family growing up. And I mean, I think normal, normal issues. And especially as the oldest child wanting to, I think I had a, a, a huge kind of performance side of myself that wanted to please people, wanted to, especially because my parents were missionaries, I wanted to do the right thing. I felt like people expected um, us to look a certain way or act a certain way. And so part of my even journey, journey spiritually was really struggling to know what does it look like to follow Christ and know that he loves me no matter what I do. And I really wanted as a young child to please him and felt very insecure in my faith if I didn't and really didn't understand that he loved me no matter what I did until probably around fourth or fifth grade that began to click for me. And right around that time is when my family moved from Pennsylvania to Ohio. And that was in the you know preteen years. And so struggling to make friends, wanting to be the popular person, wanting to be the one that everyone liked, but I was a new girl in town. And so I really struggled with knowing how do I follow God and wanting to you know, I was, I was really beginning to understand what it looked like to follow God, but I also wanted to follow my friends and I wanted to be like them and I wanted to be the cool girl. And I didn't really know how do I live in both worlds? How could both worlds come together? Um, and so when I was, um, around age 13 was when I really started to struggle in my faith and struggle with understanding, you know, what does it look like to walk with God? I think I see this in a lot of Christians, um, understanding, you know, what does it look like to trust God with my life when I want to, you know, act a different way or when I struggle to not act a certain way around my friends when everyone else is doing one thing. And that was really a pivotal time for me where I was wrestling a lot with, with my faith. And I had a really hard time expressing that to my parents. I had a really time expressing that to anyone else because I think of 
I think a lot of expectations I put on myself as the oldest child mm-hmm. and as a missionary kid. Um, I think very similar to if you grew up as a pastor's kid mm-hmm. and the pressure that you think that you have, that others have on you to look a certain way. So if I had struggles, I kept them very internal mm-hmm. and wrestled with them myself. Uh, and they would often come out in outbursts sure. um, yeah. <laughs> that you know my family would attest to right. and still. Do you remember what kind of, any specific things there were that like your friends lifestyle or wanting to follow them offered that maybe your faith did or what you didn't think it offered you know what i mean like what were those things where like you thought it was better over here but you're struggling over here or was it just like in your head well, you know, it, it was significant. And I remember in high school, I don't know if you remember this because we went to the same, we go to the same school? Anderson High yeah, School. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think um, I graduated. Yeah, yeah. Um, I remember in seventh, it was seventh grade and there was a limit to how many girls or how many people could be at a lunch table. Do you remember this? I don't know if it was true for when you were there. I don't think so because <laughs> no girls wanted me around their okay, lunch table Okay, so it was anyway, always so girls. So I think it was like eight, eight girls at a table and they were all my friends, but there was like 10 of us. And so every every day, someone would get kicked out. And oh, wow. it was awful. <laughs> I don't even know who decided that that was a good idea to limit the amount of people at a table. So, you know, lunch lady would come around and you have too many people at your table. And so everyone would gang up on whoever it is that they didn't want at the table. And so I didn't want to be the one kicked out. Mm-hmm. So it was just hard to know. I, I knew that what I was doing was wrong in ganging up on whatever poor girl didn't fit that day, but I didn't want to be the one that didn't fit. And so I didn't really know, you know, how do I act like how I know I'm supposed to act and still maintain the friendships I want to maintain when they're acting a different way. And so I just felt it was, it was brutal. Like I think a, that's that like emotional or social hunger. It's right brutal. I mean, I, I feel like it really like I has still have some like trauma from those years, but I really think, especially as a young girl, Wanting to have identity, wanting to have friends, being a new girl in, in many respects. Yeah. Um, most of my friends had kind of grown up together, but here I was. I, I think I came in around sixth grade, um, so just my second year in the city. And and I was, you know, teenage years are brutal for I think both boys and girls, and especially girls who are figuring out who they are, and everything's changing in a whole gamut of ways. Yeah. Um, and so just really struggling to know. I knew how I was supposed to live. But I didn't know how to live that way because it felt like if I lived as, you know, a nice Christian girl, then I wouldn't have any friends. And I think at the core, it was like, do I trust that God is enough for me? Do I trust who I am, you know, as someone who follows Christ? Do I trust that how he views me and sees me is enough? And in that season, it wasn't enough. You know, I wanted to be seen and valued and, you know, I wanted the boys to like me and, I would watch my friends get the boys or watch them get the things I wanted to have or have the friends I wanted to have. And I just really struggled with where my identity was Mm -hmm. and where I found my worth and where I found my belonging. And that for me as a young girl is highly emotional. And you know this, I am highly emotional still, still. Um, But I was kind of off the charts at that point. And so if I felt like I didn't belong, then I didn't belong. If I felt like God wasn't with me, then he wasn't with me. My feelings really drove my faith and drove my actions. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah, that's a tough spot too, because in the area that we grew up back then too, it's just like being the new person, puberty, teenager, emotions you're talking about as a girl wanting to fit in. But it's also even like the socioeconomic thing too. It's mm-hmm. like your family's raising money and living like you are always taken care of. But in that area where we grew up in that high school, there's a lot of upper middle class Mm -hmm. that are popular too. And so they have a different even lifestyle than you do too, that like you can't really compete with. So like it's, it's tough to, to be in that spot where, where you were like, I imagine on a lot of different areas. Yeah. I mean, where we had moved from more people were around the same economic stage as we were. Mm -hmm. So we also moved into a different place where a lot of those people were more affluent than we were. And so that was, I think, navigating that was, you know, challenging what the world tells you is what, what is good and what is um, worthy of following or what you need to have is, Mm -hmm. you know, how do you process that as a young child? And I think my parents did a great job of navigating that, teaching us how to trust God and teaching us how to know him. But I had to individually figure that out too. And those years were really pivotal for me because I wrestled so much with, with my faith. And I wrestled so much with wanting to 
follow God and seeing this part of me that didn't do it well and also didn't want to do it on one hand too. Mm-hmm. You know, I wanted to be this good Christian girl on the weekends and on Sunday. And then I wanted to do kind of what I wanted to do during the week. And I felt this tension. Sounds like a lot of people right now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I just felt this tension and that I just, I, you know, I would, I wouldn't, I don't think I understood it at the time, but I needed to know what does it look like that when you put your trust in Christ, that he enables you and gives you power to live the Christian life. I was trusting in my own strength to live the Christian life. I hadn't yet really understood what it looks like to depend on God. And growing up again as a missionary kid, you know, the Bible was very much a part of our um, a part of our life, a part of our, our day to day. Sometimes I liked that. Sometimes I didn't like that. Mm-hmm. But I will say, looking back, what it did was pro- provide a foundation for me to lean on in those times. Like I couldn't get away from God's word. And I remember when I was 13, really, really wrestling, really not liking who I was becoming, really not knowing how to be different. Mm-hmm. And I re- remember crying out to God and saying, God, I don't know how to do this. I don't know, you know, I don't know how I said it as a 13 year old, but I remember distinctly thinking, actually I might've been 14, 15, but I remember distinctly thinking, I want to live for you, but I don't know how. And I felt as if God was saying to me, not audibly, but sensing, Lindsay, if you'll trust what is true over how you feel, I'm going to do something with your life. And I remember saying, God, I don't know how to do that. Will you help me? And that was a pivotal moment for me where I began to see change in my life and change in my attitude towards my parents, change in my attitude at home, change in my even attitude towards my friendships, a greater um, freedom to just enjoy the friends that I had. They didn't have to be the popular ones. They didn't have to be, you know, I didn't have to have all the things. I still wrestle with that. But slowly I started to see God give me a contentment in my circumstances, yeah. if you will. Isn't that kind of a tough place to be sometimes, though, when you grow up in that kind of faith environment, which is you know really good. It's a loving, loving home, and you're going to church probably twice on Sundays and on Wednesdays, <laughs> yes. and you're living that life where you're, the friends, the popular kids, or whoever outside of that, they offer you a glimpse into something else, mm-hmm. and like just naturally, you want to see what it's like. Mm-hmm. And everybody's telling you how great it is. And it's like, oh, they look so happy and it's wonderful. And they're happier and have more fun than, you know, the kids at <laughs> church are yeah. having. Uh, but let's say you almost have to like go out on your own and either whether it's experiencing failure or like finding out for yourself, whether it's in high school or going into college and stuff like that. It's like you have to experience that and, and like, I guess, escape the, the bubble. Not that it's trying to make put you in a bubble, but like <laughs> it's like you have to see what it's like in order to see whether like you actually believe the things that your family does and is, I guess if it's really your faith or, Mm -hmm. you know, I'm just riding on the coattails of my family because we just go to church so much. Yeah, totally. And I think I, I felt that and I wasn't really until college where I was like, I I can make choices now. I can choose whether I go to church on Sunday. I can choose what I get involved with and what I, how I choose to spend my time. And I think again, it was, you know, I think in everyone's life, there's these pivotal moments where we're kind of at a crossroads of we're going to either choose to live one way or choose to live another way. And I would say, you know, my first kind of pivotal moment was probably when I was around that age, 13, 14, 15, um, and wrestling with how was I, how was, was I going to choose to live trusting God with my life or trying to do it all myself? And obviously that didn't fix itself overnight. And even today, you know, it's like tr- mm-hmm. struggling to walk in dependence on him. But then in college was the next really pivotal point in my life. Will I choose to engage in the things that I maybe grew up doing or go a different way? And I felt like God really use that time to solidify my faith where I began to make choices that I knew in my head, I know this is true, but I was acting as if, um, I know I really believe this is true. Like it's not, it was moving from my head to my heart in a deeper way. And God began to change me. And I think some of that really came because people started to invest in my life and they started to teach me how to connect some of the things I had learned in my head and connect it to my heart. And they started to probe into the deep, more hard places of my of my heart that I didn't really let people into in my high school years because I was afraid. I was afraid, um, you know, if people really see all of the – if they see the good, they'll like me. But if they see the bad stuff, the stuff I'm struggling with, the stuff that I'm wrestling with, will they really love me? Will they really accept me? Mm-hmm. And because I wasn't sure, I just didn't let anybody into that. Yeah. And 
I began to meet friends in college that began to go into those dark places in my heart and be vehicles of love and grace and truth in ways that I had not really fully experienced because I had never offered that to people. Mm -hmm. And that was transformative for me because it enabled me to see, really ultimately it pointed me to Christ's love for me, that, okay, he sees all of this junk and I know that he loves me in it, but it's one thing to, again, know that, but but allow him to use people to to show it to you in a fresh way. And gotcha. so that began to happen in college. So did you feel like you had, once you were graduating college, you had kind of a direction or purpose when you left, or did you know what you wanted to do with your life? How did that manifest itself? When I graduated college? Yeah, like with all this kind of mm -hmm. stuff going on, you're like, okay, I do have a purpose. I want to be this. I want to do this. And mm -hmm. God wants to use me like this. Like, what, what happened? Well, I went into college with, I wanted to do, I was a health major, and I was very into fitness. And so I just was like, well, I want to choose a major where I will be forced into a career where I will be physically fit. And I think a lot of that was, again, finding my identity and my body image and how I viewed myself. There was a connection between well, I want to control how I look and how people perceive me. And so I was, you know, and I still love fitness to this day. Um, but as my time in college went and I began to be, become involved in an organization called Crew, and um, it was formerly called Campus Crusade for Christ, and I began to really grow in that ministry. Um, it's also the ministry my parents were missionaries with. Mm -hmm. They were missionaries with mm -hmm. the high school um, branch of that. And I began to have opportunities to lead Bible studies and to invest my life into women. And I saw two things happen. One, I saw God use me. And I was like, how could he use me? Like, I can't believe that. I feel like I'd hardly know anything. And here I am showing up and watching him use me to be a part of seeing transformation happen in people's lives. And two, getting to see the transformation happen was I, I just began to think, gosh, I, I think I want to do this with my life, that I want to spend my days investing my life into women and helping them know God and make him known. And that was largely because of how I experienced people doing that with me and how I saw transformation happen in my life as a result. I just, it was a natural response for me to want to do that for others. And so that's kind of God directing me. I thought one way and then quickly over my course of my four years in college, I was like, I'm, I'm going to join the staff of crew and, um, and actually, I wanted to go overseas with crew initially. And so that's what I did. The first two years um, after college is spent abroad. Yeah. So you end up here, you are fighting at 13 and preteen mm -hmm. and like, I'm not so sure about this. And now you're getting out of college and you're doing the same kind of stuff your parents were, were doing and it, it took root and yeah. <laughs> kind of grew from there. Okay. So you, you sp I know you spent time overseas doing kind of that missionary life and you, you did come back. Um, well, obviously you're here, so you did come back. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of other stuff happened. We're but, filming overseas right now. Yeah, <laughs> where are we right now? Um, but but what was that next kind of transition in your life of after coming back for overseas? And what did you want to do with your life? And how did you want to grow up? And what was that perfect picture you were hoping to hoping to get once you came back overseas and, and happened here in, I guess, America for you? Well, of course, the whole time I was waiting for that Mr. Wright to come along. And I was, you know, I thought I was going to be not for any particular reason, not because I was dating anyone, but I thought I would be married when I was younger mm -hmm. and in my you know 20s. And I longed for that and hoped for that. And <clears throat> I came back from being overseas and I, jo I joined the staff of crew full time um, and was at my alma mater. Miami University is where I went to college. And so I went back to Miami. And that whole time I was really hoping to go back overseas. And that was really, I was hoping to meet somebody mm -hmm. and go back overseas and serve with crew. I just really, um, one of the one of the passages in the Bible that has always struck out to me is, to whom much is given, much will be required. And I sense from an even younger age that I was I was being given a lot of resources because my parents were mission missionaries. I learned a lot of as a young child, even as I wrestled, I learned a lot about mm -hmm. who God was. I learned a lot about how to tell someone about who Jesus is. And I felt like I had all these resources. And as I went overseas, I saw how little resources many believers had. They have oftentimes way more faith than I ever could muster up, uh, but just the, not the resources to go after what God has called them to go after. So I really had a heart to become more equipped and to go and 
equip people in other countries who didn't have the same resources. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we have resources on every corner in America, and this is not true for a lot of the world. Yeah, definitely. And can you speak a little bit to, like you mentioned it very briefly, just about wanting to find someone, wanting to get married. And you have, a lot of times we have this certain time frame, like I want to get married in between this age range, and then I want to start my family at this one and have my first kid. And I, it's harder for me because I take it so much for granted because mm -hmm. You know, basically got married when I wanted to. Like we dated for a long time, dated your sister, got married right out of college. And I was like, okay, now we're going to decide when we want to have a kid. And basically, yeah, we have the kid kind of the year we want to. And it is so not like that for, for mm -hmm. everybody. And especially, um, you know, I think sometimes it's harder for females. It's hard for men too, but just wanting wanting to have it. And then time goes by and you don't see it. And like your sister got married very young. You know, mm -hmm. she got married before, before you did. And, and, you know, for people like, you know, I, I noticed that, but I don't understand like how hard that can be because you just don't know what's going to happen. And if you want to have a spouse, you want to start a family and that time goes on, you're just like, especially with your faith, like, okay, God, is this going to happen? What's going on here? Like, <laughs> do you I see was me? really excited about my yeah. life and now like, yeah, I want to do it, but I mm -hmm. want somebody to do it with. And was there a certain point where that became like a little bit of tension with God or just like, okay, this is really frustrating. Yeah, you know, I think because my mom got married when she was 27, I think in my head that was that kind was of the, age, the limit. <laughs> you know, if I pass 27 and I'm not married, I think I, I always fell back on that. Well, my mom wasn't married till 27. So, you know, I could be married older. Right, right. And then 27 came and went. And it was like, wait a second, what's happening? And I dated a couple guys and those relationships didn't work out, which, you know, created its own set of disappointment and mm -hmm. pain. And I think everybody has that thing in their life, that that dream, that hope that they've in many ways put their hope in that when this happens, I will it's gonna be all good. do X, Y, and Z. Yeah. Or, and I think that thing that everyone has is really a pain point and a trigger point that exposes what we really believe about God. And that for me, that longing for a husband was the trigger point for me. And when I was younger, it was the longing for the boyfriend. It was right, the, right. you know, am I seen? Like, okay, yeah, I know, you know, God loves me or, you know, your dad can say, I love you and right. I think you're beautiful, but you just, you want the affirmation yeah. from. You can love me a lot better if you provide a man to right, do it right, too, yeah. <laughs> right, right, um, And so, but it also creates kind of this question of even how I view God and how, um, how does he see me? Does he see, okay, you know, I could sit across from girls. I had at this point, you know, age 26, 27, I had been in ministry for many years and I could sit across from girls who had the same struggle and say, you know, God is good. He's for you and he sees you. And, you know, he, he will provide what you need when you need it. But I'm not sure I believe those words mm -hmm. for myself. You know, if you turn, turn it over and say the same things to me at the time, I really, I was like, God, do you see me? Do you see the longings of my heart? Like, do you see the deepest part of me that is in, in many ways mm -hmm. aching for this and watching my friends get it, watching my sister get the desire of my heart right. um, and wondering what does that mean for my life right now? And, and I think a lot of it was just like, will I trust you with my life? Will, you, will I trust you, God, how you write my story and not how I, you know, was planning to write it? Mm -hmm. And... That was has, was and continues to be a wrestle point for me, and I think for most people, is when circumstances don't line up to what we thought they would be. I don't think we often know what our – we don't often experience disappointment until the thing that we longed for doesn't happen in our time frame or mm – -hmm. um, but then when it hits, it really creates, I think, a – question for who God is and how he works and will I trust him with my life? And so, you know, that for me was was the thing I think that God really used to bring me to his word and help me know him in a deeper way. And ultimately that drove me to um, several passages in scripture. But really, I think it was around when I was 29, um, I was watching some friends who were older and I was watching how they who in single watching how they navigated singleness and kind of learning from them learning some good things learning some bad things um and really wondering okay god like I don't know if you will have someone for me I'm not sure I long for it but what do you want to do in this waiting period and god led me to a passage in Isaiah which talks about um god's people saying at the, it's really talking about the end, about when Jesus comes and returns and he restores everything. And they say, God's people say, behold, this is our God. We have waited for you and you saved us. 
And I really kind of honed in on what does it mean to wait for God? What does it mean to wait for him in the seasons of life when we're waiting for something to happen that we long for? And I began to do research on that word to wait. And it's the Hebrew word kava. I don't even know if I'm saying it right. But it has this. What struck me was the word for it means to hope and to expect, but has this idea of being um, woven like a cord. And, you know, in, in Eastern culture, it's just more fluid. Eastern culture is more fluid. We're more linear in our culture. We're more like, you know, A to Z, you know, what time are you coming? You're late. What I've observed even from being in other cultures and Eastern culture, um, it's just everything is more fluid. And you probably experienced that too. Uh, there's not... There's airplane time, and then I remember being in some countries in Africa, and then there's African time. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I love African time. <laughs> yes. Um, so there's all, you know, this word to wait really is talking, it's talking about what's coming, but it's also talking about what's happening in the process. And this is what I've observed in other countries is that they're more concerned with the process. They're not concerned about the destination, but what's happening in the process of getting to the destination, which is why. In my, I was in Zambia for a summer and I, you know, they're concerned about the relationships and the time. So if I'm waiting for somebody, they're in relationship with somebody else and eventually they will get to, you know, our time to get together and then they'll be present in that time and get to their next destination. Yeah. But it's not so much about the destination. And so God really began to use that verse, that verse, and especially that word kava, to lead me to like, God, I want to trust you. To, I want to wait well for my future husband, if that is even going to be a thing. Um, I want to press into what you're doing in my heart and my life in the waiting. And sometimes I did that well, and sometimes I did that not so well. But what happened as a result was all of the the triggers, all of, you know, I'd watch a friend, another friend get married, another friend start to have babies. And instead of just sitting in jealousy or bitterness, it, I allow God to open my heart to, why am I jealous? What does this say about how I view him or who I believe him to be? And ultimately, I think that really rooted me in understanding his goodness and wrestling with it. I think oftentimes we're, you know, just, it's so easy to slap on God is good. And, you know, we slap that on Instagram posts or whatever it is, and it's not wrong to say because it's true, but it doesn't address, what, what about when I don't believe he's good? What about when I'm yeah. wrestling with his goodness? Like, what does God want to do to peel back the places in my heart where I don't believe he's good so that he can help me see what his goodness really is? Um, well, he was good. He gave you a man. He did. I mean, you got married and he's he's the best. He is the best. He was worth the wait. He was and, worth the wait, Kevin. You're the man. Mm -hmm. Yep. And I mean, you, you got what you wanted, the desire of your heart. Mm -hmm. You did get married to a, a great man. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that, that kind of transitioned in the next phase of probably what you had no idea was coming yes. in your life. And you, you got the husband. He's great. And, of course, you want to start a family. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you're a little bit older, too. Like, you don't have tons of years to wait if you want to have your own kids. So you want to start a family. And, and you know, I'll kind of let you take it from there. But, like, you're in that place where mm -hmm. you wanted to be. And then now you're being taken into place you never thought you would yeah. go to. Yeah. So I was 32. Three when I got married. Um, so much older than what I anticipated. And my husband, Kevin, he was 30. Was, he, was I 32 or 3? Uh, 33. I don't know. Age, you know. Um, Say whatever you want. Yeah. So we were older um, in our early 30s and wanted to start a family. And both of us were pretty in awe of how God had provided us for one another. Um, not Both of us didn't think, you know, weren't at a place where we're like, we were wondering, you know, are we to get married mm -hmm. um and so i was just enjoying the fact of, of just this tangible expression of god's goodness to us like i can't believe that god saw my heart here and gave me the desire of my heart and um i think i knew that he longs to do that for people but experiencing it was a whole different different level you know it was many years of trusting that you know God's goodness to me was singleness for 32, 33 years. And then God's goodness to me was marriage. Mm -hmm. um, so we wanted to start trying for a family fairly quickly. And so six months into marriage, we decided that we would start to try, not knowing at that point in our life, we knew that, that there could be lots of different things that could happen. Um, we had lots of friends who had struggled with infertility and um, had lost babies and so we weren't naive to think that it was going to be easy. Mm -hmm. um, but for us, we got pregnant very quickly. So six months in, we were pregnant and 
we felt like we were on this like second honeymoon phase of just excitement for our future and so there was a part of me that just just didn't anticipate that just thought this is God's goodness to us for waiting and trusting him. Mm-hmm. And I remember even on our wedding day, as we were, we, we had rented a convertible, we were on our way to the airport, and I think we were talking about, you know, our vows and, you know, our vows of, you know, we'll trust God through the uncertainties of the future and the pressures of the future and the present. And I remember just jokingly being like, oh, but the pressures of the future, like the uncertainties that will come so much later, like we'll have hard things happen so yeah. much later. Um, and so 20 weeks into our pregnancy, everything was really normal. And we went to an ultrasound and, uh, our, our, the kind of the bigger ultrasound where they check everything. And we were just concerned that the, um, the technician would slip and tell us the gender and we wanted to be surprised. And at that appointment, we, our, um, sonographer, she got really silent and she left the room and then our doctor came back and she said, um, took our hand and we knew something was wrong and said, you know, I'm so sorry. We can't seem to find your baby's skull. And so we're going to fi- we're going to send you to the high risk doctor and confirm. And we're going to send you out the back door of the, you know, the hospital, the doctor's office. And, and both of us were just in shock and like, what is, what is happening? What does that mean for our child? What does that mean for what we are going to be asked to walk? Not really knowing the ramifications for that, not even having ever heard of a condition like that—that right. that there could be a, a baby growing that didn't have a skull. Went to our high risk doctor, and he confirmed that our baby had what's called anencephaly, and it's where the brain had not formed and the skull had not formed, and our baby could live in the womb and grow, but would not live outside the womb, and there's no cure. And so we were just devastated. And I had always um, really valued life from the womb and knew that life was needed to be valued and cherished. But I had never been asked or even thought I'd be asked to live out those convictions of here was a circumstance where 95% of women would choose termination um, because that child wasn't viable for life. And for many different reasons, they would choose that. And here we were being told our choices. And I saw my little girl and found out it was a little girl on the big screen. And I remember telling the doctor without even talking to Kevin, knowing he was on the same page, I was like, we will carry her. Like we will. And he said, well, I'll give you a day to the doctor said, I'll give you, you know, you have until this time to make mm-hmm. the decision. I said, no, we will choose. We will carry this baby. And I didn't know how we would do it. I didn't know what we would do. But both Kevin and I knew we need, we're need. we going to celebrate this child for as long as God gives us this child. And I remember thinking, God, would you um, give us hours with her? And would you help us hear? Would, you, would we hear her cry? You know, the doctor at the point had told us that we wouldn't hear our baby. And usually babies born with this condition live like maybe minutes. And so my kind of big prayer at that moment was, God, give us hours. And so we left that hospital room and we, or that doctor's office, and we were just distraught, but also like, okay, God, like there was there was a residual um, foundation of trust in his goodness that had been built and even just seen in his provision of us for each other that we knew, okay, God, you're not absent from this part of our story. You're in it and we don't understand it and we're in a lot of pain, but we do believe that you're good. And we do believe that you have something for us and for this child. And so we're going to choose to step into that and celebrate. And there was this courage that I think rose up in me, this maybe mama bear courage that was just like, I'm going to protect and provide for this child, whatever the cost to me. Mm -hmm. And so over the course of, obviously we, we decided to celebrate her and we named her Sophie. Sophia Kyla um, was her name. And we just let people in on in our story. And I began to blog and really as a way to transmit all the information and things we were doing to people so they wouldn't ask me all the questions yeah. um, and also a way to process. And mm-hmm. I remember that first blog post that I sent out just sharing what was going on. And the next day I looked and there was like, 
over a thousand people had viewed it. And I was like, what is happening? Um, and God drew me back to two prayers that I had prayed. And one was that prayer when I was 14 or 15 and where I felt like God was like, Lindsay, if you would trust what is true over how you feel, I'm going to do something with your life. And the second was I had prayed that my children would, would be, have a greater impact for the gospel than I ever could. And God reminded me in that moment of those two prayers. And I just remember thinking, but not this way, God. I remember thinking, wait, did I need to clarify those prayers? Did I need to clarify, you know, like how, how you were to choose to use my children? Um, and it was a moment of just surrender. And will I let God write her story and ultimately our story too mm -hmm. for our hopes for our family? And in those first few weeks, friends rallied around us and actually created a secret Facebook group. I don't know if you were on that Facebook group, um, but maybe you were. I'm maybe. sure you were at some, at some point. I have a horrible memory. <laughs> it's okay. Um, but I'm celebrating her life, celebrating Sophie's life. And so every week we would celebrate on Thursdays. Oh, yeah. I do remember now. Yep. Yeah. And we didn't know that this was happening. Kevin kind of caught on as people started to show up. Um, Every week he caught on that there's yeah. something was going on, but it took me a while. And people just helped to celebrate and mm -hmm. they helped to celebrate her life. And I began to just blog and write about how we were celebrating her life. And all these people began to follow her, our, follow our story and fall in love with Sophie. And they never seen her. They, you know, seen ultrasound pictures of her. Um, and people started to know Sophie's name and not my name. Oh, are you Sophie's mom? I would hear, which was like precious to my heart. And so we really saw our community rally around us and value this life, which really carried us through the next 22 weeks of her life. And we did all kinds of things. Um, we had friends. I live in Orlando, Florida now. And so Disney is, you know, our stomping ground. It's a good place to celebrate. Yes. And we went to a church at the time that was lots of cast members from Disney. And all many of those people were part of the celebration. So you can only imagine, you know, if you, if you are a cast member at Disney and you're going to celebrate someone, you're going to do it like times a hundred. Sure. Um, so people organized special days at, well, at Disney to meet the princesses. Um, we had people give us gift cards so that Kevin, my husband could take us on a daddy daughter date to which he pinned a corsage on my belly. And I mean, it was just these sweet moments. My brother who works with, um, in the music industry was able to get us tickets to a boy band concert. I love boy bands. I, 98 oh, degrees, right? 98 degrees. And I was chosen to be one of the ones that are serenaded on the stage by Nick Lachey and the rest of the band. And we just laughed. And it was just really amazing how God infused life and joy into such pain. You know, I when we got that diagnosis, I just anticipated all the pain that was to come. Mm -hmm. I didn't anticipate that there would be so much joy. And that in the surrendering of our story to God, that he would write it in such a different way than what I, what I would have imagined, but such a beautiful way, filled with such joy in the midst of pain. Yeah. Um, and Sophie came into the world September 1st, 2013, and I heard her cry, which was a miracle to me in and of itself. And she lived for 10 hours, and they were precious hours. You were there. Our family were. showed up with celebration T-shirts on and – Filled the hospital room, filled, um, saying happy birthday to her. We had a cake for her. Mm -hmm. And I felt so thankful that God gave us those 10 hours. And then, obviously so sad. Mm -hmm. When we had to say goodbye. And so we said goodbye to her. And God we were ushered into a different kind of grief of, you know, it was before it was the anticipation of loss and then it was the loss itself. Um, and then it was also the hope that we could have more children at that point. Um, anencephaly is, is not very researched and most of the times it's an anomaly. There's not a whole lot to know as to why it happens. And so our doctors had done some tests and some genetic background and didn't have any reason to believe that it would happen again. Um, so we were hopeful for how God would continue to form our family, even yeah. as we grieved. And, and that's such a, I mean, there's so many <laughs> more conversations that can happen <laughs> yeah. 
with with all of this um but just even moving forward to you know for you wanting to have another child mm -hmm. like you know like you were pretty like sure like i want to we're going to do this and one because of the research it was like hey there's not like some crazy 90 percent chance if you get pregnant again this mm -hmm. is going to happen again it was it was really low i think from yeah what they said it was like un like five or like yeah. under some crazy and so it's like you know one were you ready pretty quickly once your body was able to to try to get pregnant again and where were you of being just mentally and emotionally of going through it again assuming mm -hmm. it was going to be a healthy child mm -hmm. you know yeah you know both of us you know our doctor wanted us to wait a year and i remember breaking down into tears and mm -hmm. saying like we can't wait that long i i wanted to, both of us wanted to right. start trying as soon as she gave us clearance and so she was just like give me six months um and so we were still grieving the loss of sophie mm -hmm. and i was still you know my body was still recovering um but i still was very hopeful of how our family would continue to form. And in my head, I still had in my head this expectation of, and hope, okay, I'm gonna have four kids by the time <laughs> I'm 40. Four living kids is what I anticipated. And you know, we'll get pregnant every couple of years. And I'm sure, you know, people listening are like, great, that's crazy. Or people who've, who've done that, that's crazy. Um, but I still had this idea of what, how our family would, mm -hmm. how our family would look. Then you got pregnant pretty quick. We did, again. Yes. And I was nervous this time because when you lose a child, even um, any loss of pregnancy loss, whether in the beginnings or afterwards, um, there's a loss of innocence in pregnancy. And so pregnancy was very different. The second time I was very nervous, very nervous until we could get the anatomy scan and find out for sure that, you know, our baby didn't have anything going on and really wrestling, you know, God, are you still good? Are you for us? Like, do you see us? Do you see the longings of my heart? Um, same questions, always, the, they have always right. been the same right. questions, yeah. different circumstance and different opportunity, I think, to, to dive deeper into who is God in all of this. So at 12 weeks, we were able to go to the doctor, um, and find out if our baby was okay. So we went in and hopeful and Kevin is like, you know, the optimist mm -hmm. and, you know, he was so hopeful with me and helped me have hope and, when I was fearful and we got, went into our high risk doctor and they did the scan and they were gone for so long and we were looking at it. We had gotten really good at ultrasound pictures at that point. And we we're like, this looks different. It doesn't look totally right. And he came back in the room and he said, it's not anencephaly, but it's what's called a crania and it plays out the same way. And a crania is where the brain forms, but the skull does not. Yeah. And so it looks the same as the encephaly um, at the end of pregnancy most times. And it was like, whereas God's presence felt very real to us in that in that doctor's office room with, when we found out Sophie's diagnosis, he felt very absent to me in that room. And I just looked ahead to the next at that point, you know, because we, we found out at 12 weeks. So we had a lot longer to go mm -hmm. of knowing that we would lose this child. And, and we knew at that point we we would, I never regretted carrying Sophie. So I knew that I would carry this baby, another baby girl. We named her Dasa, short for Hadassah from the Hebrew word for Esther in the Bible. And that verse, you know, passage for such a time as this, not knowing why God had allowed us to walk through this next pregnancy in the same way, but we're just trusting God for such a time as this. Like you have a purpose in this, but still wrestling so much with why in my head, okay, we walk through tragedy in life, but not back to back and not the same way. Yeah. And that was so confusing to me. And it felt like God wasn't kind in so many ways. And you and Lori were pregnant at the same time. Mm -hmm. And I was, you know, I thought, okay, gosh, this is God's redemption. Like, I'm going to be pregnant with my sister. We're going to have babies together. And my best friend was pregnant at the same time. And just wondering why I was going to lose another child. And really wondering where God was in that. And yet still hopeful, okay, how, how God are you going to show up? And we saw, you know, as again, as we told our friends this time and continued to write, we saw friends rally around us. They created a group called the cat, they're our supporting cast, which should, should first come alongside them. Mm -hmm. And they had letters to us every day of encouragement and prayers, but still it was just a darker time. We didn't know at that point. It was like the crashing of our hopes for 
how is our family going to form? Are we going to have kids? Uh, I think we had hoped for, okay, we've lost a child, but we still have hope for more children. At that point, we're like, we don't even know if this is in the cards for us. Yeah. Well, it's and, such a hard way to start marriage too. Yes. I mean, I mean we I mean, were still pretty much newlyweds right, when a, it a all couple things, went down. Like, yeah. It's like you're getting married six months in mm-hmm. and you go through that with your first daughter, you know, little time to recover. And it's because you want to have another than you think you should be able to. And they tell you you should. And then like your whole marriage in the first two, yeah, three years, whatever, is just like trauma yes yes <laughs> and going through that together after uh-huh. waiting for so long and oh man just when i hear you talk about it it's just like all these different memories come up and i mm. know how her lori was that second time mm. too because she was pregnant and you were pregnant and i vividly remember walking in this downtown street of savannah waiting for her to call me about mm. what was going to happen with with dasa and i was walking with one of my best friends down savannah and she called me and I didn't hear a voice for like three seconds. And I knew, I, I, I immediately knew like it wasn't good because she didn't say anything right away. It just took three seconds, but it felt like three minutes. And I told told my friend, I was like, I gotta go. I was like, I don't know what we're gonna do right now, but I gotta go. And I was like, here we go again. And that was just so devastating for us. So I couldn't imagine like how devastating it was for you all, like actually having to live it and experience that again. And it, it did, it, it felt very different. It yeah. was just like, you mustered up so much celebration and joy for Sophie to get through it and like, hey, we're gonna love her, be the best parents ever, and to try to have that same amount of energy the second time. <laughs> which we didn't have. Which you didn't have yeah. because you're still grieving. Yeah. It was really difficult, but you still were able to do it. But I think that the supporting cast thing is, you know, the big takeaway of like family and friends are helping you do something you can't do on your own. And I think, you know, I feel like God helped us learn how to celebrate in grief with Sophie and with Dasa. We had to learn how do how do we really suffer well, and how do we invite people into our pain and and just mm-hmm. ask people to sit with. We didn't need people to celebrate with us. We needed people to sit with us in our pain, mm-hmm. and that was much harder. You know, I wondered. You know, will where people carried our burden with Sophie? Will they carry it again? Right. How will our family walk through this with us? How will they carry it with us? And fewer people did show up to the darkness, the dark spaces, because it was just, it was a lot. And, um, but we needed those people in the dark, in the dark places. And I think that's in our society, it's hard to sit with people in pain, especially if they're in pain for an extended period of time. I hate it. Yeah. I it's really not do. comfortable. I hate it too. And, uh, you know, I want to crack a joke or I want to, you know, figure out a way out of it. And mm-hmm. I, there was no way out of this pain. It was coming. And it was there and it was coming. And it was carrying the grief of Sophie and carrying the anticipation of the grief of Dasa. And then, you know, I really, I wasn't, I don't think you're ever over grieving, but I was still in the thick of my grief with Mm -hmm. my first daughter. And so I was like double grieving with Kevin, both of us grieving differently, both of us navigating this new reality and wondering, you know, what, how will people, how will God show up? And how will people show up for us? And we were surprised. We were surprised, again, by how people showed up. It was very different. But I think we were mostly surprised by how God showed up and met us in our pain and helped us to know him in a way that, you know, will we worship God even if there's no guarantee of future circumstantial blessings? And I never had to ask that question. I always anticipated, you know, circumstantial blessings. I, but I felt like here I was at a crossroads again of, will I trust you, God? Like my, the, there's this part of me that had awakened to motherhood with no baby to mother. And I had Dasa to mother for a short amount of time. And then she was born on November 13th of 2014, just 14 months after Sophie. She lived for 12 hours. We heard her cry too, which was such such a gift. But I had all this expectation now of what our time would be like with her. You know, with Sophie, it was just such a surprise that we had 10 mm-hmm. hours. And now it was like, well, we didn't get to do this with Sophie, so I want to do this with Dasa. Or I really want to bring her home. Would she be able to be brought home? And she wasn't. And devastation in that. And um, just all of, all of this knowing of what it was like to say goodbye to Sophie, now I knew what it was like to say goodbye to your child. And it's like knowing I was going to have to go through that again Mm -hmm. and anticipating like, God, would you hold, will you hold me in that? Like 
it was so hard not to go to those spaces. Mm. And I do see that he showed up, but it was, he felt so distant and, but didn't mean he wasn't present. Mm -hmm. It's just my, my feeling of his presence was different because I, my wrestle was different and the pain was just so, so different. And yet there was a few people that God provided that stayed by our side in the midst of that and sat with us in our pain, like Job, Job's friends who didn't do it well. Um, Job needed people to sit with him in his pain. And I remember reading the story of Job after we lost Jasa and just resonating so much with one, why his friends were um, not helpful, but two, how he just lamented and brought his pain to God and how God responded to him, that God didn't give him answers. I mean, there was really no answer. There still is no answer that God could give me today that would satisfy me this side of heaven of why. Um, And I think for many of us, if we really wanted to know the answer of why, whatever pain is in our life, I'm not sure the answer would give us the um, satisfaction that Mm -hmm. we long for. But what Job got was more of God. God, you know, revealed himself to Job. And that was the journey that God began to send me on after we lost Asa of revealing himself to me in a way that I did not fully grasp who Mm -hmm. he was and how he worked. And also resetting my hope for our future family of, gosh, like, I don't even know how I'm not, I'm not, we're not trying again anytime soon. Um, I don't even know how you're going to form our family or how you're going to meet these desires of my heart that have been awakened as motherhood. But I want to trust that you will. And and you do have a family. I do have a family. Because you have two kids in my house right now. That's right. Two crazy kids. And they're very different mm-hmm. in how you got them. Yep. And, you know, I know there's, there's still, we could talk for like another five hours about yeah, yeah. everything that happened that you went through. But right now you and Kevin do have two kids. Mm-hmm. And I think it's very unique about how you have them and what happened and kind of take us through that Um you have Jaden, you have an African-American son, uh-huh. and you also have a daughter by birth. So kind of, you know, how did that, mm-hmm. how did that happen? Obviously God gave you the heart to, to adopt what, you know, I don't know if that was because you weren't sure you want to get pregnant mm-hmm. again, or you just wanted to do both or kind of where were you at that place when you decided you were going to go that that route? Well, early on, before we even pregnant with Sophie, both of us knew that we wanted to have adoption in our story. And I think like probably many families who decide desire that it comes differently than what you mm-hmm. anticipated. And so we knew after Dasa that we I was not in a state where we could neither one of us were in a state where we could try again for a biological child. And we didn't even know would we be able to right. have a healthy biological child. And so um we asked that people, instead of flowers for Dasa's memorial, would give towards a Sophie and Dasa sibling adoption fund. And when we were ready, we would begin the process um, of adoption. And mm-hmm. I knew for me, I had to be in a place where I was ready to open my heart to another child, um, not just longing for the ones that I had lost. And so that took some time. Um, and we began the process in the following year and just – trusting who would God have for us. And on on, Dasa, on Sophie's grave site, there's a passage that talks about being ministers of reconciliation. And, you know, we saw God use Sophie's life to really help people see Jesus and be reconciled to him. But God began to draw us back to that passage, even as we look towards the future of our future children, that our family would be a picture of reconciliation, not just of man to God, but man to man. And wanting our child to be... Um, wanting our family to be multicultural and to reflect in a very small way the um, picture of God's kingdom. And so we began to trust God for a child who would be a a child of color and not knowing who that would be. And um, so I actually was in Australia speaking about our story and we were at that point had been approved for adoption and we were just waiting Kevin got the call when we were, when I was still in Australia, that we had been matched and with a little boy, a little African-American boy, and that he was born, (laughs) which is not usual. Um, And so we got, I got on a flight as quickly as I could. That's the longest flight ever. Yeah, that was the longest flight of my life and literally the longest flight. Yeah, both. Um, Got off the plane and we met, went to meet our son 
at the hospital in Orlando, Florida. Mm -hmm. He was two days old at the time, and we brought him home two days later. It's not he a lot of time up, to... No, no. <laughs> and, you know, we did not anticipate that it would happen that quickly. I was, I mean, about a year process total. But once we were waiting, I remember thinking, you know, best case scenario, we're matched and the child is born, and there's mm -hmm. not all this more waiting Mm -hmm. period which i didn't know how my heart could handle that yeah. and i knew god i could trust god in that um but it was it was so sweet and so overwhelming and he is a precious gift to our whole family yeah he's the man he is the man and he brings people together and he even the nurses commented in the hospital of how that everyone was just drawn to him. Mm -hmm. So I have no idea what that means for his life and his story, but I'm excited to see how God will use his story in our family. And even his presence in our life has just transformed us in um, how we talk about reconciliation and how we talk about race and how we talk about you know the things that we want to be a part of, the conversations when we want to be a part of, the things that we see are going to be um, things that are hard for him to navigate and how do we grow as a family that we are really navigating them together uh that he experiences safety security and also connection to his culture in our family that obviously is a predominantly white family we're pretty white yeah. yeah we're pretty white um but we want him to really experience um we want him to be a strong black man confident in his skin confident in who god has called him to be mm -hmm. and it's just fun to watch him grow well, just briefly, what is what is that moment like too? And even after you bring him home, because here you are having two daughters who you can't take home, mm -hmm. who are like you know you made them. They're mm -hmm. like they're through you, and you know you know we just foster. Not not that that's less than adoption or anything, but you know eventually we do give them back. And here you are permanently getting a child who looks nothing like you, mm -hmm. who wasn't in your womb. You don't mm -hmm. have any kind of connection to besides like hey he's yours now, and you know, was there a struggle or a disconnect? Not because you didn't love him or didn't want mm -hmm. him, but just because like, this is so different than what I just experienced with them. And it's like, I thought it was going to feel this way. And it's a really struggle to get where I thought I would get to really easily with mm -hmm. him. Um, there were some disconnects, but I think the biggest thing was there was additional grief. So all the first that I experienced with Jaden, our son, it was like, oh, this is what I missed with Sophie and Dasa. It was like these first that I didn't know that I had missed. Mm -hmm. And so then there was this grief of like, I'm loving that I'm getting to do this with Jaden, but I'm so sad all of a sudden that I didn't get to do this with Sophie and Dasa because I didn't know it's that. It's triggering all those it's things. It's triggering all the things. Yeah. But there was a sweetness to the fact that he was a boy. Mm -hmm. To be honest, like that, I really had a hard time going into any stores that had girl stuff or girl clothes. And so I never, I never had dreamed of boy clothes and so there were some spaces that i feel like in god's kindness allowed me to just fully embrace having a son mm -hmm. um in a way that wasn't grievous but was more redemptive and like okay he's my first son i love that i can say he's my first son mm -hmm. um and it's not, you know, someone asked, you know, is he your first? Is he your, mm -hmm. I can say, oh, yes, he's my first son. And that's for someone who has lost a child, that's just hard questions, yeah, yeah. you know, of like, how many kids do you have? And, you know, is he your first? Is he your second? And so there's some sweetness that I feel like God allowed some space to have um, sweet redemption in that. So, mm -hmm. but there's, you know, there's, here I was learning how to parent one child, longing to be parenting three mm -hmm. at this point. Mm -hmm. And so it's just complicated. Yeah. Well, to even complicate things more. <laughs> you do make the decision that you want to try to get pregnant again. And I can't imagine how maybe it was really easy. Maybe it wasn't, but just even from a family member who loves you, like even if they give you a 0 0.001% yeah. chance of something happening again, mm -hmm. not wanting you, you and your husband to go through that again or risk it. It's not, and, you know, we did want you to, I wanted yeah, yeah. you to, but, oh, I like, understand. No. but that decision and the fear of like, if it doesn't go well again, like how, can you put yourselves through that again? And how can you how can you do that? So what was that moment? Because you did it after you got Jaden. So, yeah. I mean, was there a piece there? Or when was that that spot where you're just like, okay, it's time for us to to try. And I'm sure doctors helped yeah. a little bit. You know, after, after we adopted Jaden, I was at a place where I was like, you know what? I envision our child, our family filled with adopted children. And I felt so content with that reality. I felt like I have surrendered my dreams for bringing home a biological baby and I am thankful for the ones that he gave me. Um, 
and I felt hopeful for, okay, I, I felt just settled to God is writing a different story for our family and I'm settled in that. And yet there was a piece of me that I sensed, I sensed God saying like, what do you really want? And I would always be like, oh, I want what you want, God. I want what you got, want, God. And I just felt like he was saying, again, not audibly, but just like, what do you want? And I said, well, if I'm honest, if you could guarantee me a healthy baby, <laughs> I, that's what I would want. Um, I don't, I don't think I could emotionally handle walking through this loss, this kind mm -hmm. of loss again. Yeah. We had done a lot of tests at that point. We, the, based on just the reality of having this happen twice, a geneticist would say you have a 25% chance of it happening again. But we had no reason to believe. We had no tests. Everything was inconclusive or this mm -hmm. is interesting. Um, so they're really, it was really all like based on just our experience, mm -hmm. um, not anything scientific. And I knew that for me to try again, I had to be able, I ha God had to release me some, from some fear because fear had, was pretty debil debilitating for me. Um, and, and I told Kevin that I was like, you know what, if he begins to release me from this fear, I think I'll be ready to try again. And over the course of a couple years after we had Jaden, I began to feel hopeful for another child. And I began to feel like, okay, God, can I trust you if we step into this again? And I knew that most of my reasoning for not doing it was fear-based. And mm -hmm. I never wanted to make a decision out of fear. And I looked and I thought, okay, five years from now, will I regret if we never tried again? It's like, I don't regret carrying Sophie. I don't regret carrying Dasa to term. So I know that if I walk through it again, I won't regret it. Uh, but I might regret not trying. And so mm -hmm. that's really what turn the corner for me. Was part of that fear what other people might might think or the support you may or oh, might yeah. not get from people? Because that was, I guess if I had a fear, it wasn't just you guys going through that. It was like, if you do decide to do this and the same, something similar happens again, are people, and the family's gonna support you. Yeah. But like, are you, where here you are, like everyone's rallying around your other two, who, two girls and you during that situation, are, are people gonna like turn and be like, why would you even yeah. risk not only your marriage and yourself going through that, but why would you do that to a child? And like there, there's that yeah. other side of it that, you know, can be so, you know, if you put, like, again, if you make a decision based on that, then of course you probably wouldn't do it. And yeah. you're coming from the faith perspective of like, okay, God wants it, I'll do it. But like, that is such a heavy weight to, do and then tell people you're doing it and like them just have all kind of judgment about whether you should be going through that or not. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there was that fear of what will people think? Will people come alongside of us if we have to walk through this again? And then there was just the fear of like, if we have to walk through loss, like, will I be like a need to be put somewhere to yeah, like a mental. Yes. Hospital yes. I feared how I would be emotionally yeah. if I had to walk through another loss. Um, so that fear was was twofold. And I knew at the end of the day, Kevin and I both knew it was ultimately our decision to make. Mm -hmm. And, you know, coming from a faith perspective, I believe that God is the author of life. And if he allows for life to happen, then he has a purpose for that life. And um, we just, you know, I sensed that I had another pregnancy in me. I can't explain that. It's not, you know, it was mm -hmm. a feeling, but um, I just sensed that I wasn't done. And... I didn't know what that meant, but God began to give us courage to try again. And and then and the last time was not as easy, which um, we didn't get pregnant right away. And I was very grateful for that because I think that it kind of, again, prepared me <laughs> and right. helped me to process what my desires were, what my fears were. Um, but eventually we did get pregnant. And I will tell you that I held my breath that entire pregnancy. And we went in at 12 weeks and we saw the skull and the brain on our baby found out it was a girl um so it was like now i was pregnant carrying a healthy baby but i didn't know how to carry a healthy baby all i knew was how to carry a baby that <laughs> wasn't gonna live and so it was strange it was a strange pregnancy i my friends had to coax me into having a baby shower because it was like too much hope, too much like, too much like, wow, could, will I really bring this baby home? Um, after we saw the baby's brain and skull, I was hopeful, but I still was holding my breath. I was like, I will believe it when we bring this baby home. Yeah. And I remember the day that she was born, July 2nd, 2018. 
and when she was pulled out of me and God just provided just our same doctors, even same nurses as before. And it was just the most beautiful moment of joy mixed with all the pain mm -hmm. of memory of what that moment was like before. And her name is Briella. We combined the middle names of Sophie and Dessa and um, so named her after her sister. And she is such a delight and such a joy. And Jaden like adores her and she adores Jaden. And it's precious to watch them, their sibling love grow. And it's so sweet to see um, our girls in her. And I mean, I can't believe that she's in our arms. I can't believe that Jaden's in our arms. And I miss Sophie and Dasa so much. Um, but I'm so grateful for each of the children that he's given us. Mm -hmm. And it's strange to be parenting two and be a mom of four. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm just so hopeful for the day that we're all reunited. But just they're all such gifts to me and such. But, but all of them have just displayed um, God's value of life in such unique ways mm -hmm. and beautiful ways. Yeah, I think looking looking back on it, not and it's not like happily ever after or anything. No. Now you have to no. be a parent. <laughs> I know. Like it's a different kind of heart. It's navigate a different all kind these of heart. all these different personalities and 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 that which we all all do when we have kids. But um, I, I I think looking back on it for for me, and I remember telling Kevin this too. It's just like like you're one of the best dads I've ever met, mm. and it was you know two two daughters who lived for only like ten mm. and twelve hours from the whole process, from when they were in the womb to when they were born to even afterwards, like you had your kids for so long, but you're still one of the best, you're the mm. best parents I've ever met for how much love you had for them and you celebrate them and keep their memory alive and just the joy that they got to experience for their whole life here. Mm -hmm. And to me, that's such a amazing thing that you can look back on that and mm. be proud of that. And you know, your family knows that, other people know that, and then you get to pass, pass that on to your kids as opposed to if that didn't happen, you mm -hmm. know what I mean? Like it was just fully why, why, why darkness the whole time. Mm -hmm. And then you have two kids and you're, the foundation is built on instead of joy and like life, it's built on, you know, death and depression and stuff mm -hmm. like that. And I know you go through hard stuff, but it's mm -hmm. like there, for you to have a family, it was built on a foundation of love and joy, mm -hmm. even through all that. Yeah. So now you can have a loving family. And yeah. to me, that's what's really cool to see. And, just reaffirms what you say about your two kids right now. Mm -hmm. Like that's, and kids, I can't kids pick up what they get yeah. from their parents. So, you know, yeah. if it wasn't like that, then it would be different. Yeah. And you know, I can't imagine, you know, they, we wouldn't have any of our children without the child before them. Right. So it's like, I can't imagine our story without Jaden and without mm -hmm. Briella, but they are, they would not be in our life without the story that God gave Sophie and Dasa. Mm -hmm. And so that's hard to reconcile at times, but it's like, I, I have to just, be release myself to say okay this is a different story and i know that there is a purpose in all of it and that god has gifted me these children that you know i did have four children by the time i was 40 just in a completely different way yeah, than what i anticipated wow. and you know one day i'll understand mm -hmm. I'll, I'll understand all of it um but they well, are such gifts and you know we we all go through different kind of stuff and mm -hmm. <laughs> When we moved down to Savannah, we went through a couple of things too, just in life. And people were like, oh, you you know, how would you felt if you knew that was going to happen? It's like, man, if, if, if God told you or somebody told you what you were going to experience like these next three to five years, you would have said no. No way. Yeah. I you wouldn't have, said have done no. it. No, it's and true. That's so true with yeah. my life too. If you would have told me like, some of these things that would have happened, it's like, I've been like, no, I'm going to stay where we're at and figure out some different. So it's like, we can't understand mm -mm. <laughs> whether it's past, present or future. We can't understand everything or like we we won't go through it the way we're supposed to. Mm -hmm. And it's been an incredible, incredible journey. We love you. We love your kids, your family and glad you're having Thanksgiving with us. So yes, I appreciate we're it. Glad to be here. But before we end the podcast, too, um, we always ask our guests um, something that they some advice or something that they can share for people that have that have heard your story or mm -hmm. give some advice like. When I was going through this, this, these are the kind of things that can help somebody when I was going through this kind of stuff, whether it's, you know, you're going to lose a child or mm -hmm. just the emotional hurt of, of something like just these small things. They don't have to be a family member. You don't have to be a best friend, but just an everyday person. 
when you see someone going through something like this, here's how you can really make an impact in their in their life in a loving way. Mm-hmm. What, what what is a thing or two that you would let somebody know? Like for someone in helping someone go through this, yeah. you know, I would say to not be afraid of someone's pain and to not try to fix it. Just sit with them in it and ask them about their story or ask, do, they, do you want to talk about your story right now? Specifically with a child, like to say their name. Like that's, people ask all the time, what's the most helpful? It's like, I uh, never get tired of hearing someone say Sophie and Dossett's name. Yeah. And I know of no parent who's lost a child that ever gets tired of that. They want their name to be acknowledged. You know, how, how are you doing with the loss of Sophie? You know, how are you doing with the loss of Dasa? How are you doing with the loss of, say the name. Mm-hmm. Honestly, if there's anything I would say to anyone who has known anyone who's lost a child, it's to say their name. And they might not they might not want to talk about it. I think sometimes they're afraid. I don't want to make them cry. It's like we are already crying. Like <laughs> there is no making me cry any harder than I have it's a good cried. Cry. Like, like you're, yeah. you're having a good cry. Yeah. Right it's yeah. it's like they're sweet tears. Like they're tears yeah. of acknowledgement of the pain. And I think we are afraid of pain in our society. And we're afraid of sitting with people in their grief. And we need to sit with people in their pain. And we need to acknowledge that it's hard. And we can offer hope to them. And we can, you know, what do you need right now? Or or just, you know gosh, like maybe I'll bring them coffee or I'll bring them or say I'm thinking about, I'm thinking about, you know, when I knew mm-hmm. so-and-so. So I just think that's the the most precious thing to a parent who's lost a child. And for someone who's grieving to just sit with them in their pain um, is the best thing that you can do. And, you know, for someone who is who is connected to their faith to remind them that Jesus sees your pain. Like he, he knows your pain and for someone wrestling with their faith, like he knows your pain and he sees it and he sits with you in it and, um, he will bring light. There will be a day when there is light and I needed counselors to tell me that, you know, it will Mm -hmm. not be dark forever. It feels dark forever when you're in the midst of grief. Um, but it's okay that it's dark now, but it won't be dark forever. So good words. And I appreciate you sitting here yes. <laughs> with me for this podcast. I'm glad we, we made it work and that we get to share your da- daughter's story again, Sophie and Dasa. I think that's was always an exciting thing for me to finally do is just to. And you wrote a book, too. I, oh, yes. I didn't want to forget that. Oh, you, yeah, that's you, OK. <laughs> there's so many other things, yeah. but you wrote a book. Yes. You want to just ex- yes. I mean, not explain the whole thing, but just yeah, what yeah. it is. And So the book is called Buried Dreams mm-hmm. from Devastating Loss to Unimaginable Hope. You can find it on Amazon or any any bookseller. Um, look for Lindsay Dennis. And it really is just our story of that time period yep. of loss, um, of what does it look like to trust God when um, the dreams that you thought you had for your life are all but gone. Yeah. A great Christmas present for somebody. This yeah. Holiday yeah. Season. <laughs> Anyone <laughs> grieving, probably. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for being Thanks my sister-in-law. Having, allow me to marry your me. sister. I know yes, you had you questions know. about me. For, I know. And you finally allowed me no, into I your family. I encouraged her. I encouraged her all the way. Okay. Let it be said. On the record. On the record. Finally. <laughs> finally have it on camera. Yeah. Gwen, thanks for producing. City Church, thanks for hosting. This has been the Neglected Podcast, and we'll catch you next time. Peace. Peace.